Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. On June 7, 2002, officers from the York Regional Police arrived at a residence in Richmond Hill, a city just north of Toronto, Ontario. They had been called there by a lawyer representing the homeowner, who stated that his client had material information about an ongoing missing persons case. As police would soon learn, however, the information the homeowner was referring to wasn't any ordinary kind of tip, sighting, or obscure detail that they had missed. In fact, as per an agreement between the lawyer and police, the homeowner would not be making any kind of verbal statement at all that day. Instead, when officers entered the man's house, he led them through the foyer of his spacious suburban property and down the stairs into the finished basement. There, near a furnace room, he revealed a false wall. It concealed a chilling secret. As truly horrific as this secret was, though, it was only a glimpse of the unbelievable case to come, one which was wrought with an endless onslaught of shameless tactics orchestrated by a single, unfathomable narcissist who made it his personal mission to undermine and test the Canadian justice system at every turn. This is the story of Richard Rick Wills, the defendant from hell. Before we get into today's story, if you find our videos interesting and informative, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Also, we know that today's video is quite a long one, but we assure you that it's definitely worth it. Make sure you watch all the way through, because at the end, we have some stuff to reveal that adds another ridiculous layer to this already chilling story. With that out of the way, let's get into it. On February 15th, 2002, a woman named Lavinia Linda Mariani was reported missing by her family. Linda was a 40-year-old bookkeeper who lived in Richmond Hill, was married, and was the mother of a teenage son. She and her husband, Dominic, were also the owners of a local power skating school, a business which Linda was passionate about and which took up a great deal of her time. In other words, Linda had a full and, by all appearances, happy life. She seemed like the last person who would disappear suddenly especially without giving anyone the slightest impression that anything was wrong. Almost immediately after York Regional Police began investigating Linda's disappearance, they received nearly a dozen calls about her husband, Dominic. All of these calls were made by a 45-year-old man who identified himself as Rick Wills. Rick was a family friend of Linda and Dominic's, and he and his wife, Joanne, had formerly co-owned the couple's power skating business with them, which they had all purchased together in 1998. Even though Linda had taken full ownership of the business in 2001, Rick had stayed very involved in the day-to-day -day operations, whether it was on or off the ice. Rick was also a constable with the Toronto Police, a 25-year veteran of the force who had mostly worked in the department's traffic services division. During the course of his calls with investigators, Rick repeatedly implicated Dominic in Linda's disappearance in any way he could. He claimed that he was just really close to the family and knew that things had been very bad between her and her husband. However, when police looked into these claims, they were not convinced. While it was no secret that Dominic and Linda's relationship hadn't been the most passionate in the lead-up to her disappearance, it was far from the mess that Rick had described. Dominic said that while they slept in separate beds at home, they cared for each other deeply and that there had been no discussion about ending their marriage. Soon, police were convinced that Dominic had nothing to do with his wife's disappearance. However, they weren't so sure the same could be said about Rick Wills. It turned out that Rick hadn't been the only one to point fingers almost immediately after Linda's disappearance. Several of her friends had also reached out to York Regional Police, and most of them said the same thing. Take a good look at Rick. After all, they claimed, the two of them had been having an affair for almost a decade. Linda's friends went on to explain that she and Rick had started seeing each other all the way back in 1993. Originally, Linda had been a friend of Rick's wife, Joanne, but shortly after the two of them were introduced, 
they began sleeping together. At first, Linda's friends were merely surprised by the affair. But then, as it continued to go on for years, things started to get more and more uncomfortable. Nonetheless, they kept her secret quiet. In the year or so before her disappearance, however, friends said that they had noticed a change in Linda. However bizarre the situation had been up until that point, at least previously she had seemed happy. Now, though, she said that she was growing tired of Rick and his jealous and controlling behavior. Still, she seemed scared to actually go through with ending the relationship, and even suggested that Rick might be tapping her phone to listen in on her calls. These details were made all the more significant when police learned that the last place Linda Mariani had been seen was at Rick's Hart Street home in the neighborhood of North Richvale. Knowing this, police began to fear the worst. It was highly likely, they theorized, that Linda was already dead. When Rick was confronted with this information, he admitted to the affair, but said that he had nothing to do with Linda's disappearance. Instead, he claimed that he wanted to find her more than anyone, and that her disappearance had taken a serious emotional toll on him. Once again, he tried to implicate Dominic Mariani, but police were not convinced. That being said, when a search of Rick's home was conducted just a few days into the investigation, police came up empty-handed. It wasn't clear to them where to go from there. Then, about a month into the investigation, police were approached by another one of Linda's friends, Janet Amar. Janet described herself as an intuitive healer and a practitioner of natural medicine, and said that she had an idea that could help make some progress in the case. She said that as part of her work, she knew a lot about psychics and was aware that Rick also believed in their powers. She thought police could use this to their advantage. Investigators agreed. The plan was simple. Janet would convince Rick to seek out the help of a psychic to locate Linda. This psychic would, in fact, be an undercover police officer, one who would pretend to uncover information concerning Linda's whereabouts, hopefully prompting Rick to either crack and share what he knew, or else give them some other kind of clue related to her disappearance. The operation was dubbed Project Willpower. Sure enough, when Janet began calling Rick and introduced the idea of employing a psychic in the search, he took the bait. He was keen to try and keep up appearances in whatever way possible, something police were sure he would do after hearing the 16 messages Rick had left on Linda's business phone line in the first week or so after she went missing. The calls had started out upbeat, slowly descending into more desperate-sounding pleas as time went on. Investigators were convinced it was all an act, though, just like he had before. Rick had been sure to once again try and implicate Linda's husband in the messages he had supposedly left for her. Over the next couple of months, Janet recorded numerous phone calls with Rick, in which she explained that she had found a highly recommended psychic named Yusuf to assist them in the search for Linda. Yusuf had worked on a number of similar cases, Janet said, and had been successful in finding multiple other missing people. Yusuf, of course, was not a real psychic but was the undercover police officer authorities planned to use when a meeting was finally arranged. In the meantime, Janet began to feed Rick information she said that Yusuf had provided her during purported psychic readings. She told Rick that Yusuf had managed to contact Linda using his powers. Sadly, the psychic had been able to confirm that Linda was dead, but stated that when he spoke to Linda, she was more concerned about the person who hurt her. She wanted that person to know that police were onto them and that they were close to finding her body. As he had done up until this point, publicly, Rick feigned ignorance, asking who this person could be. However, privately, it seemed that Janet had been right about her assessment of Rick's belief in psychics all along. Just before Rick was scheduled to meet with Yusuf himself, he hired a lawyer. The lawyer contacted York Regional Police and said that Rick had, quote, material information that he wanted to share. After leading police through his large home on June 7, 2002, Rick revealed the false wall to them in the finished basement. Behind it was a more than one meter high 
60-gallon garbage bin. It had been wrapped in plastic and had been sealed with caulking and adhesive tape. It had also been bolted on three sides. When police opened it, to their horror, they discovered Linda Mariani's badly decomposed remains inside. She had been put into the container head first, and a child's skipping rope was wrapped around her neck. The back of her skull had been fractured, and a later autopsy would show that she had died of blunt force trauma to the head. The cause of the fracture was immediately clear to police. She had been hit with a small aluminum baseball bat that had also been concealed in the garbage bin. While Rick Wills was arrested on the spot and charged with second-degree murder, his name was initially subject to a publication ban in the Canadian press. This highly unusual move, which is normally done to protect victims, not perpetrators, was immediately challenged by multiple media outlets, including the Toronto Sun and the Toronto Star. If you know anything about Canadian media, you'll be familiar that it's rare for those two to be on the same side of any issue. But in this case, their combined efforts were successful. Incidentally, just before the charges against Rick were upgraded to first-degree murder. It was only later that the public would learn why the publication ban had been granted in the first place. It was part of the deal Rick and his lawyer had made with investigators before agreeing to show them where Linda's body was. Many people, however, speculated that there might be an additional reason. It was the police looking after one of their own. After all, Rick hadn't even been suspended after his arrest and was allowed to continue collecting a paycheck while in custody. He would ultimately retire with his pension before his trial. Little did anyone know, however, that this controversy was just the beginning of what Rick Wills had in store. Despite being caught essentially red-handed, he would manage to turn what should have been an open-and-shut case into a never-ending legal circus. The case against Rick Wills was fairly straightforward. Aside from the damning evidence police already had against him, following his arrest, even more people came forward with things to report, including one friend who said that he had outright confessed to the murder. Based on these new statements, police were able to fill in even more parts of their theory of what had happened. They discovered that beginning in the summer of 2000, Rick had started to take steps to leave his wife Joanne so that he could be with Linda. A separation agreement was eventually put into place, and Joanne and their three kids had moved out sometime in 2001. After this, police alleged, Rick had gotten more and more insistent that Linda also leave her husband. However, as friends had told them before, she wasn't prepared to do this. They further argued that things had finally come to a head in February of 2002, when Rick murdered Linda after it became clear to him that she no longer wanted to be with him. He had entombed her remains in his basement, believing that they would never be found, and that his knowledge of policing made him clever enough to successfully fool investigators into thinking Linda's husband was the actual culprit. All of that being said, right from the moment he was arrested, Rick tried his best to muddy the waters and delay court proceedings as much as possible. Early on, while in custody, he claimed that he was being framed by the York Regional Police and that he wanted the RCMP to look into the original investigation. When this baseless accusation was rejected, Rick asked for a mental health assessment. During the assessment, he more or less confessed to killing Linda, though said it was like an out-of-body experience. He also claimed that he had a vision that she was the devil. It was clear to the psychiatrist that assessed Rick that he was angling for an insanity plea and that the story he told had been rehearsed. He was declared legally fit to stand trial, though was diagnosed with a narcissistic personality disorder. As you'll see, this was hardly a difficult diagnosis to make. By the time that a preliminary hearing began in 2004, Rick had adopted a new tactic. After hiring and firing several lawyers, he had decided to represent himself in court. He claimed that he had made this decision because he was broke and could not afford proper legal counsel after his application for financial assistance from Legal Aid Ontario was rejected. This claim was true, but only in the narrow sense that his application had been rejected. The reason it had been rejected 
is because Rick's so-called financial problems had been entirely self-imposed. It turned out that at the time of his arrest, Rick's total net worth was well over a million dollars. As anyone acquainted with him reportedly knew all too well, he had bragged about this routinely to anyone who would listen, saying that he had been a millionaire by the age of 28 because of real estate transactions. In fact, this was his excuse for why he had never risen through the ranks of the Toronto police. In his words, he wasn't interested in promotions because he didn't need the money. In actuality, he had been disciplined twice for discreditable conduct on the job. That being said, starting before he had even been taken into custody, Rick had begun to systematically divest himself of all of his assets. This reportedly included his home in Richmond Hill, four other rental properties, his vehicles, a half-interest in a family cottage, and his police pension, all of which were either signed over to his estranged wife, his sister, or his three children. When Rick represented himself at the preliminary hearing, it soon became clear to everyone involved just how destructive he could be. While in court, the ex-police officer went on long-winded monologues and rants that had little if anything to do with the topics at hand. When he wasn't doing this, he was actively insulting anyone he could think of, from the two crown prosecutors to random witnesses and even the judge. He would routinely interrupt anyone who was speaking other than him, either to offer what he obviously felt were helpful corrections, or simply to shout at someone to impugn their character or call them a liar. Using these tactics, he was able to stretch the preliminary hearing out to an agonizing 67 days over the course of eight months. By the end of these proceedings, it was obvious to the presiding judge, Ontario Superior Court Justice Brian Shaughnessy, that something had to be done. His major concern was that if Rick was allowed to proceed to a jury trial without proper legal representation, that there was serious danger that any subsequent decision could be overturned on the grounds that Rick had not been provided with an adequate defense. As a result, Shaughnessy made the decision to grant an order allowing Rick to receive legal aid. While Shaughnessy understandably hoped that proper legal counsel would rein in Rick's ridiculous behavior in the courtroom, this proved to be wishful thinking. In fact, by the time pre-trial motions had started in front of a new judge, Michelle first, in January of 2005, Rick informed her that he had still not managed to find a lawyer, at least one who would work for the rates that Legal Aid Ontario was willing to pay, a maximum of $96 per hour. By this time, word had gotten around about Rick's courtroom tangents and outbursts, and no one seemed to think it was worth the cash. As a glimpse of what these lawyers were up against, Here's a list of so-called qualifications that Rick said he was looking for from anyone interested in the job. He reportedly gave this list to a journalist sometime in 2005 while trying to drum up publicity for his case. The list read, quote, Wanted, person possessing these qualities. 1. The allegiance of a mercenary. Each new cause is the only cause until accomplished. Number 2. The dedication of a Jesuit priest burned at the stake for their cause, true to the very end. Number three, the tenacity of a wolverine. Once the fight is on, the fight ain't over till it's over. Number four, the elusive intelligence of a Pentium 12 computer, equipped with the wisdom of how to apply such a gift. Number five, the longevity of a Timex watch, takes a lickin' and keeps on tickin'. Number six, the courage of Neil Armstrong, courage of one's convictions. Number seven, the ability to discern the difference between right and wrong with the fortitude to tell the world. If so, please step up to the plate now in the interests of justice. At the bottom of this list was a postscript, which read, quote, wannabes, fall downs, judases, rats, weasels, etc. need not apply within. However, these persons are of great demand within the York Regional Police Force and the Newmarket Crown Attorney's Office. Amazingly, in an attempt to move the case along, an agreement was reached in April of that year that the province would foot the bill for a respected lawyer named Cindy Wasser, who agreed to take the case for more than twice the normal going rate of legal aid. 
$200 per hour. Rick thanked Wasser by firing her a couple months later and hiring yet another expensive lawyer, a Zambian-born man who worked on Toronto's Bay Street named Munyanzwe Hamalengwa. With Hamalengwa on the case, pretrial proceedings did finally get underway in January of 2006, but not without Rick ratcheting up the notch of his courtroom antics even further. Though he had a lawyer representing him, Rick still acted like he was the one in control of the case, constantly whispering and writing notes to Hamalengwa during the proceedings in order to try and get him to say what he wanted him to and to ask the questions that he wanted him to ask. When Rick was relegated to the prisoner's box, he got even more disruptive, routinely passing gas, burping loudly, or yelling and shouting while other people were testifying or trying to speak. It was during this time that Rick also took to urinating in the police cars that drove him from jail to the courthouse every day, something which he reportedly did at least half a dozen times. In a similar vein, things hit a disgusting climax in May of 2006, when Rick purposefully defecated himself in court, only to pull some of the feces out of his pants and call his lawyer over. To her credit, Judge First reportedly refused to let Rick derail the proceedings completely, no matter how hard he tried. In that particular instance, without missing a beat, she apparently asked the court clerk to hand Rick some Kleenex and hand sanitizer. Like Shaughnessy, Judge First's primary concern was reportedly making sure that there was no way that Rick could argue that he hadn't gotten a fair trial. She refused to hold him in contempt of court, and instead came up with creative solutions to move the case along. One of these tactics was to create a specialized isolation area for Rick outside of the courtroom, nicknamed the Rubber Room, which was hooked up with audiovisual equipment so that Rick could still hear and see everything that was going on and confer with his lawyers, but could not make any kind of impact on the courtroom itself. This isn't to say that he didn't try, though. Throughout the proceedings, Rick routinely hurled abuses at everyone involved, including his own lawyer. We obviously can't repeat all the things that he said here, but let's just say he reveled in calling Judge First the C-word, and was also quite fond of using a vile racial slur when insulting his Zambian-born lawyer. Just like in the preliminary hearing, though Rick wasn't able to totally derail the case, he was able to stretch it out with the pretrial arguments taking 140 in-court days over the span of a year and a half. When the case was finally ready for opening arguments in the spring of 2007, Rick fired Hamalengwa and hired a man named Raj Nepal. Nepal was reportedly the 11th lawyer to represent Rick in some capacity in the case. Just as he had with Hamalengwa, from the moment the jury trial began, Rick tried to control every aspect of the defense that Nepal provided. Much to the frustration of Judge First, Nepal seemed more than happy to take these directions, to the point where he was reportedly reminded fairly regularly by the judge who was supposed to be the lawyer. At no time was this more so the case than when Rick took the stand in his own defense. With the jury now present, Rick apparently made the unspoken calculation that he needed to change tactics once again. Because he now needed to win these people over, being as purposely obnoxious as he had been in previous parts of the trial wouldn't be as effective. What he obviously didn't realize, though, was that him trying to be charming was just as obnoxious. Rick argued that not only was he not guilty of murder, but that the entire situation that had landed him before the court had been the result of his unwavering commitment to do right by his former lover. He claimed that on February 15, 2002, Linda had come to his house as part of an annual Valentine's Day ritual between the two of them. For a week every year, they would exchange gifts, and on this particular day, it was his turn. He said that he had surprised Linda with a ceramic bear, which he had placed on either the first or second step of the winding staircase in the foyer of his home. He claimed that Linda had slipped while picking up the gift and had fallen backwards, hitting her head. As for why she had fallen, Rick shared further insight. 
He said that Linda had been angry about something to do with his estranged wife, Joanne, and had been criticizing her at the time and not paying attention. After this, he reportedly remarked, quote, If it wasn't for Joanne, this never would have happened to her. This ridiculous assertion aside, Rick next tried to explain why he hadn't called the police after the supposed fall. He said that it was obvious that Linda was dead and that nothing could be done for her, and stated that his decision to place her in the garbage container had been the result of a so-called lover's pact. He said that Linda had always wanted to be buried at his family's cottage near Wasaga Beach, and that he knew that if he contacted the police, they would put her in the space at the mausoleum that her and her husband had previously purchased. He said that this is not what she wanted. When prosecutors asked Wills if Linda would have wanted to be concealed in a garbage container and entombed in his basement, he complained that they were making his actions sound, quote, coarse and terrible. Besides, he argued, this had only been a temporary solution. He said that he had wanted to move the body right after Linda had died, but that he had needed to wait for police to get off his back, and argued that the ground would have been too cold at the cottage at the time for him to dig properly. As he would repeat throughout the trial in what he evidently thought was a folksy-sounding manner, quote, I had to do what I had to do. Because it would literally take hours to go over every simultaneously horrifying and outrageous thing Rick Wills said during his five-month trial, during which time he spent nearly two full weeks on the witness stand, here are just a few of the things that stood out to us. For starters, there was his need to build himself up as the best, no matter what the situation was. He was the best handyman, the best lover, even the best at scoring discounts and deals at stores. He also frequently referred to himself in the third person. That was, when he wasn't busy comparing himself to the 80s television character MacGyver, referencing his penchant for brilliant problem-solving and improvisation. As far as the discounts went, Rick often showed off his encyclopedic recollection of the prices he had paid for things during the trial. The ceramic bear that Linda had supposedly died while trying to pick up it was $24.94 at Walmart. The garbage bin he had used to hide her body, he wanted the jury to know that he had gotten a great deal on it at Home Depot. In fact, he claimed he had bought it with Linda just days before she died because she had liked it so much. During one particularly stunning moment during the trial, Rick reportedly got out of the witness box and picked up an identical garbage bin that had been brought in as an exhibit and lifted it over his head while extolling the virtues of the garbage bin and explaining how to properly close it so that not even raccoons could get inside, he stated, quote, This thing is heavy duty. It weighs over 25 pounds. Judge First had to tell Rick to put the bin down, as his lawyer, Raj Nepal, said nothing. Reports state that several members of the jury noticeably recoiled in horror while this scene was playing out in the courtroom. Even the aluminum bat that police argued was the murder weapon, had a story behind it that Rick was all too eager to share. Welling up with tears on the stand, he explained how it had been his youngest son's t-ball bat. He was batting like a champ, Rick said, before stating, quote, I have a lot of great memories with this bat, and every one of them is good. He went on to fondly regale the jury with a story about how he had frequently used it to threaten neighborhood teenagers who came too close to his kid's treehouse, though quickly backpedaled and said that he had never actually hit anyone with it. In case you were wondering, yes, Rick made sure to let the jury know that he had gotten the bat on sale. It was a steal at $19.99. Speaking of the treehouse, Rick also repeatedly brought up his skills as a handyman. At one point, he spoke at length about the process of choosing between two different types of caulking he had to use to seal the garbage bin before putting it in the wall, seemingly oblivious to the callous way in which he was actually describing hiding a body. Relatedly, he also brought up the fact that the bin was only bolted on three sides, evidently believing that this was some sort of proof that he had only meant to conceal Linda temporarily. He bragged that if he had actually planned to kill someone, there's no way anyone would have ever found out. Referencing his handiwork, he stated, quote, 
Rick Wills doesn't bolt three sides. I'm serious. Rick Wills bolts all four sides. I'm not a melon head. It was perhaps while speaking about his supposedly amazing prowess as a lover, though, that Rick was at his most disturbing and strangest. Explaining his infidelity, he said, quote, Police are notorious for fooling around. Having a uniform and a ring is like a bug light in cottage country. He described his relationship with Linda, much like he described his son's t-ball games, saying, quote, Linda was a champ. She was the ultimate mother. She was my female version. Apparently, this is how Rick described almost everyone, though, as after going into a particularly graphic description of his physical relationship with Linda, he also stopped and said, quote, I am sorry that my wife has to hear this, but she is a champ. While all of this is so strange that it can border on amusing at points to hear about it in such a condensed fashion, it's important to remember that this was a living nightmare for the friends and family of Linda Mariani, as well as Rick's own estranged wife and children. Linda's father was actually ejected from the courtroom after two different outbursts during the trial, when he understandably ran out of patience for Rick's unrelenting antics. Finally, though, after months, the trial finally concluded in October of 2007. When it did, it took the jury less than 10 hours to find Rick Wills guilty of first-degree murder, earning him an automatic life sentence without the possibility of parole for 25 years. If you've been following up until now, though, you likely know that this isn't the end. Rather than being defeated by the prospect of a life behind bars, Rick left the courtroom with a wink and a smile, vowing to appeal the case. In the meantime, though, news finally started to break about just how much money this insane circus of a trial had cost Ontario taxpayers. It turned out that after getting the order for the green light on financial assistance, Legal Aid Ontario had completely dropped the ball in terms of applying any kind of checks or safeguards in terms of Rick Will's legal spending. His lawyers had billed incredible amounts, often for dubious costs. For example, one of the members of the defense team was reportedly just a third-year law student who had billed $40,000 in hours despite not allegedly being qualified to do the jobs that he had done. This law student also reportedly billed thousands of dollars extra for his friend to crop autopsy photos, which they allegedly did at a local camera store, in flagrant violation of a number of rules and regulations surrounding the handling of evidence. When a full report was produced about the situation, it was estimated that Rick Wills had forced Ontarians to pay nearly $1.5 million for his legal defense. Money he had gotten, as a reminder, by pretending to be poor, even though by his own admission, he was a millionaire at the time of his arrest. While the Ontario government did go after Wills and his family for years after this to try and recover some of this money, it's unclear how successful they actually were. What we do know is that some kind of a settlement was finally reached in 2016. Rick, meanwhile, tried to appeal his case from behind bars, even having the audacity to apply for legal aid a second time to try and get the taxpayers to fund his case once again. Thankfully, this time he was unsuccessful and was forced to remain behind bars. It turns out that once incarcerated, Rick was no less of a treat for the people around him than he had been during his trial. In fact, in 2012, it was reported that he was being moved from Ontario's Kingston Penitentiary to another maximum security facility in British Columbia, partly because of how much he was hated by the people on his cell block. One of those people was notorious Canadian killer Paul Bernardo. You heard that right. Rick Wills was too much for Paul Bernardo. According to the latest reports we could find, Rick is eligible for day parole beginning in June of 2024, and for full parole in June of 2027. It remains to be seen if either of these will be granted. As for the final bit of information we teased at the beginning of the video, it's actually the fact that I sort of have a chilling personal connection to this case through one of my best friends. In fact, it's the reason that we chose to cover this case in the first place. I had first heard about it years ago when he told me about it, 
but he reminded me again recently when we were hanging out. As we mentioned earlier, Rick Wills was involved in a local power skating school in Richmond Hill, but what we didn't tell you is that he was also the coach of some fairly competitive children's hockey teams at both the AA and AAA level. When we were kids, my friend was on one of those hockey teams. As part of my research for this video, I asked him a couple of questions. As for what kind of coach Rick was, he said that he was pretty crazy, but also quite effective. In his words, quote, I think about half of that team ended up playing in Major Junior, and two guys played in the NHL. One of them currently plays for the New York Islanders. Also, one of his coaching strategies was to prioritize getting penalties and playing the game shorthanded, but having the other team in fear. We played most of the game with two guys in the penalty box, but still won almost every game, which I've never seen done by any other team in my career. As a final chilling note, my friend actually remembers going into Rick's house for something once, and it just so happens that it lines up with the timeline of the case. Again, he says, quote, We weren't allowed to stay there for very long, and there was a big dumpster outside full of building materials. I can't remember the exact date, but Linda was missing at the time, and we definitely didn't go in after they found her. So yeah, I think it's a safe bet that she was in the wall at the time. I don't know about the rest of you, but every time I've thought about that since my friend told me, it chills me to my core. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a minute to thank our amazing supporters over on Patreon. As many of you are aware, our situation on YouTube always seems to be a bit uncertain, but our patrons help to ensure that we can continue to make content like this long term without having to worry as much about what surprises might be thrown our way. Plus, Patrons also get access to four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. If you'd like to help support the channel directly, head over to patreon.com slash crimezone to join. You can also find that link in the description below. As always, thank you so much for watching, and take care.